question is Dr. Tenarsan, who's a senior consultant with Turekna Eye Foundation, Coimbatore, who shall be talking on the essentials, ultrasound in ophthalmology for posterior segment evaluation. On to you. Good evening, everyone. And I'm thankful to AOS and ARC and Chitramam for giving me this wonderful opportunity. So I'll be discussing about essentials of B-scan in posterior segment evaluation. So coming to uh, the principle, uh, the electric energy is converted into sound energy, sound energy in the piezoelectric crystals and the sound energy is reflected in the intraocular structures and the reflected waves are captured in the probe and it is converted in the, into the images in the monitor. The frequency of wave is inversely proportional to its wavelength, whereas wavelength is directly proportional to its penetration. Hence, larger the frequency, lesser is the penetration, and more is the resolution of resultant echographs. So these are the different frequencies used in different ultrasound probes. And we have a time amplitude A scan, brightness B scan, combination of the above. In addition, the modification, we have three-dimensional ultrasound and combination of color Doppler with B scan. So in the probes, we can have three different sections. The transfer section, the, uh, the transducer, is, transducer is kept parallel to the limbus and the marker is also kept parallel to the limbus and it helps in detecting the lateral extension of the lesion. Whereas in the longitudinal section, the transducer is kept perpendicular to the limbus and the probe is towards always towards the center of cornea. It helps in detecting the anterior posterior limit of the lesion and the optic disc will always be inferior to the macula in this section. Whereas in the axial, it is measured in the primary case and the probe will be kept in the center of cornea and it helps in detecting the lesion or membrane in relation to the optic nerve. How to define, describe the lesion? In terms of internal reflectivity or echogenicity or in terms of in relation to the location, extension and in dimension, shape and structure in relation to the mobility. So what are the indications of B-scan? Uh, the following media opacity conditions and in the following clear media conditions. So coming to some clinical scenarios, acidular hyalosis commonly we come across. So in ultrasound, it appears as a small, mild to moderate vitreous dot echoes with a clear translucent space behind the vitreous dot echoes under the retina. It is classical of acidular hyalosis. And commonly we, with vitreous hemorrhage, there are different causes of vitreous hemorrhage. It could be proliferative diaptic retinopathy or PVD induced or ocular trauma. So how ultrasound is going to help in the diagnosis and management. So the first picture shows a fresh vitreous hemorrhage with the low to medium moderate vitreous uh, echoes. Whereas the second picture shows the uh, liquefied vitreous with the pseudomembrane formation. So in the ultrasound, we can detect the, whether the vitreous hemorrhage is fresh or it is in the uh, previous vitreous hemorrhage. And in diapertic vitreous hemorrhage, again, we can notice subhyalite hemorrhage. So here we can see there is a moderate to severe vitreous dot echoes behind the vitreous in front of the retina. So classically, it is subhyalite hemorrhage is definitely indicated for surgery. Again, in diapertic vitreous hemorrhage, it is definitely to look for tractions. With underlying hemorrhage, there will be fibrovascular tractions pulling the macula and retina. It is it help, the ultrasound will be helpful in planning the surgery and in explaining the prognosis to the patient. And again, in the vitreous hemorrhage in the elderly population, we should look for any subretinal hemorrhage at the macula because the prognosis and the visual outcome for these patients are very less. So in post vitrectus vitrectomized high re vitreous hemorrhage, that is a re bleed, the vitreous uh, hemorrhage is very difficult to pick up. Only if you increase the gain, we can see mild to moderate vitreous dot echoes. So this is a case of PVD induced vitreous hemorrhage. The first picture shows a complete PVD. Second picture shows incomplete PVD. So how to differentiate PVD from RD? So in PVD, you can see a thin line which disappears if we reduce the gain. Whereas in retinal detachment, if you reduce the gain, the reflectivity will still persist. And in the retinal detachment, the retina will always be attached to the optic disc, whereas it might or may not be attached to the uh, optic disc in cases of PVD. And there will be a classic after movement, which will be persistent in posterior vitreous detachment, where, where it is absent in cases of retinal detachment. So again, in retinal detachment, you can see 100% spike in the A scan. In cases of chronic retinal detachment, you can see the multiple intraretinal cysts. And depending upon the PVR formation, it could be open funnel or closed funnel configuration of retinal detachment. Whereas in diapertic tractional retinal detachment, 
you can see a tent like configuration which is extended mostly in the posterior fold and again the tabletop configuration will also be seen and again it will be helpful in planning the surgery and uh, whereas in vascular trds it will be restricted to the equator beyond the equators and this is a case of exudative rd and you can see there's a classic uh, shifting fluid the first picture is taken in the lying down position second picture is taken in the uh, sitting position the convexity and the fluid increases and again we have to look for rcs thickness and, and any underlying masses because of the pathology of any inflammatory condition or any mass underlying lesion which causes exudative rd so coming to choroidal detachment how to differentiate from retinal detachment usually choroidal detachment will be restricted uh, towards periphery it will be dome shaped and the mobility will be very minimal and it will be of serous variety or hemorrhagic variety and post surgically in buccal you can see a buccal indent and first picture shows post vitrectomy silicon oil space there is a retro silicon oil space and which helps in uh, detecting underfilled or overfilled eyes and this is a post vitrectomized gas filled eye you can see the shadowing and uh, extensive shadowing behind the meniscus of gas and coming to retinoblastoma there will be a mass lesion which could be exophytic or endophytic with multiple calcification within the lesion and there will be a post acoustic shadowing and concomitant rd might or may not be present and again another cause of leukocoria in children will be a persistent how to differentiate from retinoblastoma it will be a microphthalmos the axial length will be very less and there will be a tor thickened vitreous band adherent to the optic disc it's a classic picture of eval melanoma where you can see the coral button appearance or mushroom shaped appearance and choroidal excavation will also be there so again some inflammatory conditions in posterior scleritis there will be classic t sign which is mainly due to low, low reflective infiltrate behind the peripapillary sclera and in addition there will be increased rcs thickness it's a classic called tenor sir yes ma'am so vkd syndrome we can see multiple serous detachments in addition there will be rcs thickness and if we increase the gain there will be mild vitreous dot echoes in front of suggestive of inflammation thank you ma'am thank you that was a very detailed talk uh, just one question to one of the guest uh, expert panel uh, Dr. Lalit is there. Dr. Atul Kumar, not there. Okay, last. Dr. Abhinash, how do you measure axial length in a high myopic cephaloma? Oh, axial length. We uh, want it. I have never done that. Uh, but the issue is uh, axial length. The contact length would be far better than anything else. Then a non. The limiting factor here is, of course, the regeneration and yeah, the potential for regeneration of the outer retinal cells, and that is something that we are still waiting to see how much. Um... Uh, could you mute? Yes, yes, Doctor uh, Abhinash. Could you continue? In some cases, uh, particularly high myopes, where there's a lot of. Me, I think you have to uh, mute. Someone is attending two meetings at the same. Yeah, two meetings. This is such Atul a. Atul must be attending three, four meetings. <laughs> oh no, there's a gross insult to ARC. No, no, we won't. Do <laughs> so where were we? Who was Dr. Avinash? Dr. Avinash. Yeah. Hmm. So I, I would prefer the contact lens way of going about with the measurement of uh, axial length, and so that would be the preferred modality for me. But I'm, I have I have to admit that in all ways by which we have the various new instruments, the IOL masters and all those things, which can give a better uh, way of calculating. Uh, theoretically, I know, but practically, to be honest, I have no experience. Anybody to add? Tenarson, you want to tell something? Yeah, uh, in ultrasound we can measure, but the only thing IOL master will have the fixation. Whereas uh, it will help in exactly the it will fixate over the fovea. Whereas in ultrasound uh, we cannot fixate. Depend upon the where the posterior staphyloma is. If the fovea is at the edge of the staphyloma or it's the center of the staphyloma, there will be a variation in uh, in the measurement of axial length. So a better method will be where the eye fixates. So IOL master will be best. Thank you. So you said the same answer in a different way.